You were talking about irony earlier. We're gonna talk about open spaces in one of the most claustrophobic rooms on campus. <laughs> From my birth, I was recycling. It's like the first thing that I learned to do was separate out the, the glass and the paper and the cans. It seemed like we were always environmentally focused. We would, our vacations wouldn't be to Disneyland, they'd be to my grandma's cabin. You know, that was like half because we couldn't afford to go to Disneyland and half because the cabin and that is idyllic setting is the kind of place we better than going to, to Disneyland. Towns. It's the kind of place we prefer to build cemeteries. I mean, if you want to bury your loved one, you bury them in an idyllic setting because that's where you would like to go to remember them. And Rochester Cemetery is one of those. I, I think the sacred, settings. in sort of a global statement, it comes from creation. All created things are gifts and are part of the It's really, really hard to be sympathetic sense with, sacred. say, plague bacteria. The value of nature is completely determined determined by humans. Like, nature, I don't think, has any value outside of what it's humans give It's awfully hard to be sympathetic with rats. I'm sorry. And yet those two are living creatures. I think that it's really important for us to give nature that we value nature. I think that it's important that we have a high regard for nature. I think for, for recreation, for ecological services, we for can it to where it evolved, just we places can describe it to, to go uh, and to the be way we were made. not I don't surrounded care. by 20,000 people every day. And Church law and would dictate a, huge value a religious cemetery that's going to be religious forever because we own it and no one else is going to do it. A city cemetery, then you know they would have to listen, I suppose, to the more of the voices of the people of the city, and there may be a, a little less of the idea that this needs to be kept. You know, there's pioneer graves, and no one knows where they even are, and whatever, and so we'll make a park out of it. Chester Township look for a place to bury their dead, and instead of picking a windswept hilltop, they picked. Uh, they picked a, a rolling area of land that was prairie savanna that had these scattered gigantic oak trees and that had uh, beautiful wildflowers between the trees that had this, what well, is hard to describe as anything short of an idyllic setting. If you try to, if you try to come up closer to theological or spiritual interpretations of the value of nature. Much fuzzier, it's, it's, it's harder to pin down, and therefore those arguments are harder to sell. Convert everyone to uh, some kind of neo-paganism. Currently, the, uh, the, the, the hot young religion which tries to put a spiritual value on natural areas. But I find those arguments very difficult in part because I have a hard time 
accepting the arguments of young religions. It's hard to call something a tradition if it was invented uh, 10 years ago. So we don't want to disturb them. So part of it is what I said earlier was people like to go visit there, but if no one goes to visit, we still say they, they, they are in eternity. To step aside We're from being humans tied to is space and time. So it, sometimes uh, people say no one visits, no one does so, whatever. And, and, and to justify yeah, that's true from that perspective. But there's another whole perspective here, and that's in eternity. Evolution that well, where do we think people evolved the savannas of Africa. When we get a chance, do we build suburban neighborhoods with scattered, homes, lots of hedges, and lots of scattered trees providing of open space and shadow. That is a savanna. We make them in our suburbia. To live, our notion of a garden, our notion of the garden, Eden. What do people picture for that garden? Again, they picture this, this mixture of grassy fields and, and pretty flowers and trees. In some countries, they would practice cremation, primarily because of lack of, of land space to dedicate forever as cemeteries. I guess the one thing is they shouldn't be forgotten would be the long-term thing. And, and there's a danger of that if they aren't put in sort of a sacred place. go to whatever, there's, there's more expensive tickets, less expensive tickets, more expensive clothes, whatever, there's all those sort of cultural things. But in, in somewhat of a sense, in churches, the rich can sit right next to the poor. You know, there's not really, there's an equalizer in some ways in the Christian community, there's not more important seats and less important seats. And also in death, you don't take anything with you. You, you die in one sense. Oh, I, def I definitely think it, it forces the same. I definitely think that it, it's a great equalizer. It's like when you're when you're in the when you're in the middle of the of the back country or or in the middle of a prayer, you don't you know, you don't there's nothing that that sets you apart in society, you know. The, the kings are the same as the peasants at that point. You know, they might just have nicer shoes because everything you had Either you had a will and it goes to the ones you want or the state takes it. So there's a, in church and in death, it's a, we're equal. In general though, and some cemeteries have tried to uniform things because it's like you got this big thing and little thing and, and cemeteries in a sense, there's an equality of everybody, however they lived in life, they all died as a Christian and so there's a, there's an equality thing, and so I think cemeteries are a little getting away from extravagance in one way or the other. And it has a uniformity and a beauty about it because it's, it's their body. It's step not aside them. from being humans is because you're out there, difficult. you're enjoying the exact same thing. Even if you go, even if you go to like a football game or something, there's 80,000 people, but 80,000 people are not enjoying the same thing. You know, there's there's 4,000 people in the box seats and a couple hundred in the in the super luxury boxes, you know, but I mean it's kind of it's kind of the same atmosphere as like as like a tailgating atmosphere where you're just you're all hanging out and you're all kind of enjoying the same thing. I mean you think of the catacombs, they had very powerful Christian symbols. You know, whether it was words or gestures or symbols. And uh, traditionally, that's what it should be. You know, here lies a Christian, not a NASCAR lover. But that means, again, it's a human value. We don't have any way of stepping outside of our being human that I'm aware of. Rochester Cemetery is a really good example, I think, of two groups of values coming together to serve the same purpose. I think that it is, it is a holy, a sac like a sacred place, like you say, and it is a, it is a, a prairie remnant, but it's both, and it functions really well as both. And I think, I think it being a prairie remnant increases its its value as a sacred place. Yeah. Well, I feel it, but it's really hard to quantify. It's really hard to justify it. I'm not sure we need to justify it. We don't need to ask why do people need natural areas. 
we just need to observe that they do. I think people go to cemeteries looking for some sort of peace. And to put that next to a prairie just increases the ability to find that peace. I have an easy time saying yes. Very clear evidence exists. People really value natural areas. Uh, just look at prices adjacent to them. But I can argue in terms of the value of something as something that humans value demonstrably because we're willing to pay for it. If you live adjacent to a big wild, you do have uh, a deer jumping over the fence and eating tulips. Well, I'll pay for that. I want to live there. Stop planting tulips and hostas. Deer food. Plant things that the deer don't eat from my property. You hear people say, oh, I'm going to the Grand Canyon and it made me feel so small and insignificant and I felt my place in the world, you know, and, it, and I always think, why would you go to the Grand Canyon to feel insignificant? It's like, I would, if I wanted to feel insignificant, I would go to downtown Los Angeles and buy a, you know, buy a burrito from a guy in a, at a stand. walking around in the prairie, like, you're going to have definite impact on some small, minuscule organism, like, life-changing. Like, if you step on a plant and destroy that plant and then another one has a chance to grow up. If you want to answer or ask a question about a hierarchy of spaces, it either is objectively a sacred space or it was significant, something significant happened to be there, and so, I've sort of made it my sacred space, and sacred spaces are places to go back to because you connect with the space and the relationship thing that happened there. There are some spaces that are sacred to me and everybody else say, not sacred about that to me. Wherever you go outside in nature, at least with me, I always feel not connected in the sense that, oh, I'm connected, but connected in the sense where you, you do feel like there is an, there is an energy that you can, you can feed off of almost. <laughs>